Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you speak to us, that you reveal what is true. God, thank you that your word is a gift that keeps on giving, that you continue to speak and to lead and to guide. I pray that you would speak to us now. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Today, I want to ruin a word for you. Have you ever had this happen before? Like you have a word and you know what it means, but then someone comes along and they say something or they do something or they explain something and you can never think of or use that word the same way again. Uh, some of you are teachers. You've had students with particular names and you subsequently remove those names from your list of potential names for your own children because they just ruin the name for you, right? Perhaps it's a neighbor. Uh, when we lived in Cincinnati, we had a neighbor named Karen, and when we had some fence and some property line issues, she lived up to this current cultural expectation of all that it means to be a Karen. We're trying to ruin an entire name for everyone, right? And, and then we moved here to Colorado Springs, and this big 80-mile-hour windstorm comes through and knocks down the fence in our backyard that separates our backyard from our neighbor's backyard. So very quickly, we meet our new neighbors over fences and property line issues. And wouldn't you know, her name, oh yes, was Karen. But thanks be to God, she has redeemed the name for us. She is a wonderful woman who loves Jesus and our kids, and that's great. So what word do I want to ruin for you today? The word is curiosity. Currently in our culture, curiosity almost always is a positive thing, right? Like we encourage leaders and managers to get curious about others. We commend our kids for their curiosity. And when we're in relationship with others, we find it flattering when they are curious about us. They want to get to know us, all the unknown parts of our lives. Curiosity is an intellectual appetite, a, a desire, a hunger but not all desire for knowledge is good. In fact, we Christians have a long history of distinguishing bad desires for knowledge from good desires for knowledge. And curiosity is a word long associated with the bad desire for knowledge. So now every time you hear someone use the word curiosity, you're going to be thinking in your mind, that's bad, like I've been for the past multiple years, and the word will be ruined for you too. Curiosity was a vice long before it found its way onto this list of virtues. And the only remnants of this like vicious desire for knowledge, this vice aspect of curiosity, comes to us in old Proverbs. We recall that it killed the cat. It's perhaps hard for us moderns to think of any desire for knowledge as a bad thing. Like we live in the information age. We eat information for breakfast, mostly through our smartphones as we're sitting around the breakfast table, right? And one of the things that's happened is we have information, but no interpretation. As someone who has spent about a decade in student ministry, I, I got a front row seat to this phenomenon. Right, middle school students used to go to their grandparents and interview them and ask them about the great world wars and how does life work and family history. The older generation were the keepers of knowledge and wisdom. But now everything that needs to be known can be found on a phone. Just ask Google or Siri or ChatGPT, right? And see what happened is now grandparents started coming to their kids going, can you show me how to use this cell phone? And by the way, grandparents are the only ones that call it a cell phone. Our kids just call it a phone. Like, this is all they know, right? But what's happened is they have access to information with no interpretation. If it's not the first three hits on Google, it's not true. And although the technology may be new, the problem isn't. This goes all the way back to our first parents, Adam and Eve. But I think we would do well to think of them more like children. Adam and Eve were innocent, but not yet fully mature. They were made good, but meant to grow up. They had the information of creation, but they were tempted to mistrust God's interpretation of that. And when you have creation 
without interpretation, it's temptation. Creation without interpretation is temptation. See, from the very beginning and all through Scripture, we see two things. God acts and God speaks. He does things and He talks about it. Right? Like, God, when He wanted to reveal Himself to us, didn't give us a list of doctrines to memorize. He didn't give us this systematic theology to organize. He did things. He said things. He entered into covenantal relationship with us. He gives us the work of God in creation and the word of God in covenant. And these two things are meant to be tethered together. He gives us creation with interpretation. So what went wrong? Well, in our Genesis passage today, we see that Satan comes as a serpent. He comes as a creature, one of God's creation. And he comes with the word of God. And he's not so much trying to convince us that creation is bad. He's simply trying to cast doubt on God's interpretation. Did God really say? He wants to sow seeds of doubt in God's goodness. Did God really say? That's not the way the world works. And God knows it. He knows that your eyes are going to be opened, that you'll be like God, knowing good from evil. Satan made them curious. What good thing is God keeping from me? What do I not know because God hasn't told me the whole story? I guess I'm on my own to go figure it out, right? And in this moment, human experience gets elevated over God's word. And in the text, we see the shift from sound to sight, from words spoken to things seen with the eyes. God created by speaking. Even right now, he's holding all things together by the word of his power. But Satan comes and he said to the woman, did God say? And the woman said, yes, this is what God said. And then Satan said, your eyes will be opened. And the woman saw that the fruit was good. It was pleasing to the eyes, desired to make one wise, to give them knowledge, insight into good and evil. So they took they grasped, they ate, and their eyes were opened. And sound doesn't return to the story until God shows back up on the scene. They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the day. And he called and said, and Adam said, I heard the sound of you walking, and I knew I was naked. And he said, who told you? God is a God who is always speaking, but Satan wants us only seeing he wants to cut us off from the word of God, the thing that makes sense of life in reality. God spoke. He communicated with his creatures. He gave knowledge as a gift. His words were to be received as gift, and he was to be received as the giver of all good gifts. You see, it's not that God wanted to keep Adam and Eve from knowledge. But how they acquire that knowledge matters. He wanted them to have both gifts and giver, both creation and interpretation. But curiosity cuts us off from God. You may be saying, okay, Eric, I get it. Curiosity is bad. It's not the good type of desire for knowledge. But what word are we supposed to use? Well, historically, the word is studiousness. Curiosity, studiousness. Curious, studious. And now you see my dilemma, right? Like, I lost this really cool sounding word like curiosity, and I was given studiousness in its place. So let's see if we can redeem the word curiosity. Uh, for, the, for the studiousness, for this good type of knowledge, we're going to call it a attentive curiosity, to attend to something. And for this negative curiosity, we're going to call it a possessive curiosity. Possessive curiosity and attentive curiosity. You see, attentive curiosity desires to know more because of what it already knows. God has said things, and they're good, and I long to know more of what he has to say. Attentive curiosity is driven and directed by love. Love of the known and the desire to know more because of that. Possessive curiosity uh, appears to be a love of the unknown 
but in fact, it's actually a hatred of everything unknown and a desire to pull everything from the realm of the unknown into the realm of the known. Possessive curiosity is fueled by this anxious hatred of the unknown. It wants to know everything and be God. We see this type of possessive curiosity in the academics, right? Like we want to be the first scientist to discover. We want to be the first inventor with a prototype that works. We want to be the first one to print. I saw it first. I said it first. My words, I made them copyright mine. Possessive curiosity. Possessive curiosity, it deals in spectacle and novelty. It has to always be new and bigger and better in the next book and the next product and the next discovery. And spectacle, bigger and better, but wait, there's more, right? This is the way our world works. It arrogantly says, mine. It wants to sequester, to control, to dominate, to to own. It wants to eliminate God from the equation and exalt creation as God. And all the better if the creation that gets exalted as God is me. Right? In possessive curiosity, there's only two. Me and what's mine. Possessive. Attentive curiosity does not seek to possess. It wants to participate lovingly in. It receives both the gift that's given and in so doing receives the giver on the other side. It maintains the distinction between creation and creator. There's not just two, there's three. The giver, the gift, and us as the recipients of both gift and giver. A tense of curiosity still discover the goodness in this created world. It still wants to receive as gift and offer back as gift. It doesn't say these are my words, I made them. It acknowledges we swim in a sea of words that made us. And we offer these words back as gift. All things have been made by the word himself. You see, what we learn from Genesis 3 is that it's not just what we know, but how we come to know it that matters. Creation without interpretation is temptation. This was Adam and Eve's problem in the beginning, and it's still our problem today. This is what our passage in Romans is telling us. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. His invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. It's our lustful hearts, our curious hearts. That scene in Genesis is the seed of what Scripture later comes to call the lust of the eyes, curiosity, a desire to possess control, to take what is good and make it God, to take creation and make it the creator. And what happens in the process is not just that we lose God, but in losing God, we lose ourselves. We lose what it means to be human. We are enticed and dragged away. We get what we think we want, and we despair. One author says that in possessive curiosity, the appetite or new knowledge that belonged to them ravishes them. They are violated and dragged away with full consent 
in eager cooperation. Paul says, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Our possessive curiosity has not just ruined words, it's ruined creation. It's ruined us. We see this so clearly in the pornographic culture in which we live. And porn is possessive curiosity to its core. It takes a person and makes them a body. And not just a body, but my body. Something I can do what I want with, that I can dominate, that I can control, that I can sequester, that I can own. They're mine. They exist for me because my desires are now God. But what do we do when we get bored? We bring more of the unknown into the realm of the known. You need something new to possess. Rarely does someone who is addicted to or dabbling in pornography go back to the same picture over and over again. The name of the game is novelty and spectacle. They need something new or someone new every night. It has to be bigger and better to keep their curiosity. But it's not just porn. When we are possessed by a possessive curiosity, even the pure can be profaned. We can be sent into any relationship. We think that if we like it, we can just put a ring on it because we own it as if it's not a person. We power up in our relationships. We want what we want out of this thing, whether you're my boss or my brother or my baby or my bride. I want what's mine. Like marriage is about two, right? Me and mine. We want to own, we want to possess. In other words, if you're single, marriage is not going to fix the problem. We bring the problems with us into all of our relationships. Attentive curiosity knows that all of this is creation corrupted. This is not the way it's supposed to be. When we attend to God and we attend to others with this attentive curiosity, we're able to receive them as gift. We see that even in a fallen world, the image of God can still be discovered. Even in those pictures where that person has been used and made a spectacle of, we still see the image bearer of God. It's not that creation isn't good. Creation, even in its fallen state, is so dangerously good, we're tempted to worship creation rather than the creator. A tense of curiosity sends us into marriage, knowing that we've been given as gift, and that we must receive our spouse, or any relationship, our brothers, our sisters, our bosses, as gift from God. We, we don't seek spectacle, but icon. And repetition replaces novelty. We show up to the same person in the same bed every single night to delight in them and wonder what new thing may, might we discover 50 years in? What new gift might we discover in them and what new giver might we discover in God through showing up over and over and over again? All this language, desire and delight and wonder, this is part of the grammar of intellectual appetite, of hunger. So desire is speaking of this longing for an object that is not yet here. And when that object of longing and desire shows up and it's healthy and whole, delight is the proper response. We delight in this thing. And wonder is this ongoing process of a, of a desire producing delight. It's here, and we enjoy it, and we receive it, and we delight in it, and it stirs more desires within us. But what do we do when the object of our longing, the thing we desire, shows up and is damaged? It's not the way it's supposed to be. The language is lament. And brothers and sisters, we have been tempted by creation. We have been led away by our longings. We have both damaged others and we have been damaged ourselves by others. And I don't know what you've done and I don't know what's been done to you, 
but I know that we need to lament. This is not the way it's supposed to be. Creation languishes under our longings because we've left God and gone our own way. Creation without interpretation is temptation. The longing for something beyond what God has given or beyond the time in which God has given or the way that God has given it always leads us to less and it makes us less in the process. Temptation always leads to us being less. We see this all through Scripture, and there's really only two temptations in Scripture, the temptation of Adam and the temptation of Jesus. And Satan is not just trying to tempt them to be God. What he's tempting them is to not be human. Adam, don't be human. Grasp God-likeness. This is the same temptation we see with Jesus in our gospel reading. Matthew chapter 4. Then Jesus led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. No kidding. And then the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God. Now God has just said the very first, the very chapter before this, as he comes up out of the baptismal waters, This is my beloved Son. And Satan comes and goes, if you are the Son of God. Jesus, I know God's interpretation of you. I know he thinks you're his, you're his son, but like, how are you feeling right now, Jesus? Kind of hungry, kind of lonely? You're going to trust what he says? You're going to take him at his word? Don't be hungry. Don't be human. If you're the Son of God, grasp Godness. Take your power. Make these stones bread. It's the very same temptation. Satan is once again trying to drive a wedge between the work of God and the word of God. In the temptation of Adam, he separates man from God. And in the temptation of Jesus, he's trying to maintain that separation because he knows if God takes humanity back to himself, he's done. And the temptation of Adam was the fall of man, and the temptation of Jesus is the fall of Satan. Satan is going, oh, humanity? Oh, Jesus, that word's ruined. You better keep your distance from that flesh. It's fallen. The damage is done. But when Jesus becomes human, that word does not ruin him. Jesus is the word who came to redeem all words, to set all things right, to unite the work of God in creation back to the word of God in new covenant in his body. Jesus, the Word of God, becomes the work of God. The Creator becomes creature. He enters into His creation. All things were made for Him and in Him and through Him. He is the work of God in creation, and He is the Word of God. John 1 says that He explained Him. The Son came to explain the Father. And he came not just to explain what it means to be God. He also came to explain what it means to be human. He came to reinterpret humanity for us, to redeem humanity for us. When we let God be God and we embrace our humanity, we are free finally to look up as well as down. Creation with God's interpretation becomes a conduit to bring us back to God himself. You see, creation was meant to be place that our affections can move through creation back to God. Idolatry happens when our affections and our longings terminate in creation itself, rather than moving through creation as a conduit to terminate in God, to find all that we're longing for in Him. In Christ, the God-man came to us to declare that creation is not ultimately ruined. It's been reinterpreted, redeemed, and so have you. So are we. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you are good and what you do is good. And you have said it is good. God, we thank you that even as we are enticed 
and dragged away as we seek to be our own gods. You do not leave us alone. You don't remain removed from us. You don't leave us in this ruined state. You come all the way to us to reinterpret and to redeem. God, may we believe your word today that by your word you are making all things new. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we move into this time of reflection and response, I just want to invite you, if there's anyone here who needs prayer, there's going to be prayer partners available down front on either side. Let me encourage you, don't remain alone. Don't get isolated or dragged away. If you're struggling, trust God and his word, what he's spoken to you. Run to God and run to God's people. If you're holding something that has arrived in your life damaged, whether it's jobs, families, marriage, children, let one of us lament with you. Let us hold you up to God as gift and let him give himself to you today.